Good afternoon and welcome to the LIFT second quarter 2021 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode to prevent any background noise. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session and instructions will be given at that time. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star, then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Sonia Banerji, Head of Investor Relations. You may begin. Thank you. Welcome to the Lyft earnings call for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021. Joining me today to discuss Lyft's results and key business initiatives are our co-founder and CEO, Logan Green, co-founder and president, John Zimmer, and chief financial officer, Brian Roberts. A recording of this conference call will be available on our investor relations website at investor.lift.com shortly after this call has ended. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that during the call, we will be making forward-looking statements. This includes statements relating to the expected impact of the continuing COVID-19 pandemic, the performance of our business, future financial results and guidance, strategy, long-term growth, and overall future prospects. We will also make statements regarding regulatory matters. These statements are subject to known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected or implied during this call. In particular, those described in our risk factors included in our Form 10-Q for the first quarter of 2021, filed on May 6, 2021, and our Form 10-Q for the second quarter of 2021 that will be filed by August 9, 2021, as well as the current uncertainty and unpredictability in our business, the markets, and economy. You should not rely on our forward-looking statements as predictions of future events. All forward-looking statements that we make on this call are based on assumptions and beliefs as of the date hereof, and LIFT disclaims any obligation to update any forward-looking statements except as required by law. Our discussion today will include non-GAAP financial measures. These non-GAAP measures should be considered in addition to and not as a substitute for or in isolation from our GAAP results. Information regarding our non-GAAP financial results including a reconciliation of our historical gap to non-GAAP results, may be found in our earnings release, which was furnished with our Form 8K filed today with the SEC, and may also be found on our investor relations website. I would now like to turn the conference call over to LIFT co-founder and chief executive officer, Logan Green. Logan? Thanks, Sonia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our call today. I'm excited to discuss our Q2 results. We had a great quarter. We beat our outlook across every metric, and we have growing momentum. This quarter, we crossed a milestone that we've had our sights on for quite some time. Since our inception, we've worked hard to defy the odds with a deep belief in our mission. We've consistently innovated and made big bets, from launching and scaling peer-to-peer transportation, to pioneering shared rides, to becoming the largest North American bike share operator, to navigating regulatory hurdles and more. We've built a strong track record. Today, we add achieving adjusted EBITDA profitability to this list. I want to extend a special thanks to each and every member of the Lyft community. Your hard work and dedication made this possible. It's a significant milestone for our business and for our industry. Ride sharing is now so mainstream that it's easy to lose sight of how much has changed. Less than 10 years ago, peer-to-peer ride sharing didn't exist. Lyft launched in 2012, and it took a year to reach a million rides. Now we facilitate hundreds of millions of rides every year. When I think about how far we've come and how much the team has accomplished, I'm incredibly proud. In the fall of 2019, we announced our plan to reach adjusted EBITDA profitability in Q4 of 2021. This was an ambitious target and we had our work cut out. For context, in the quarter we announced this commitment, we had an adjusted EBITDA loss of around $130 million. And for the prior fiscal year, the loss was close to a billion dollars. Then a once in a century global pandemic hit that literally halted travel. And at the same time, Proposition 22 was playing out in California, one of our largest markets. It's hard to imagine a more challenging backdrop. But the team rallied together. We assessed every aspect of our business and rebuilt stronger. Innovating and pushing back against the odds is core to our DNA. John and I have been fighting for our mission business, and this industry for more than a decade. And now we've built a much stronger company. The fact that we achieved adjusted EBITDA profitability two full quarters earlier than we initially expected is clear evidence of this fact. 
We achieved this milestone relatively early in the recovery, all while continuing to invest in growth. Going forward, we expect to maintain adjusted EBITDA profitability. As we said in our original founder's letter from our IPO, we're going to continue to strategically balance our investments in growth with profitability and deliberately lean into growth, especially since it's still early days. I'm incredibly excited about our roadmap. We're going to build a significantly larger company by attacking the trillion-dollar market opportunity in front of us. This quarter marks an important milestone, but it's just the beginning. Our mission is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation, and we will continue working to deliver on this goal. I'd now like to turn to a few specific highlights from Q2. Demand continued to strengthen across the markets we operate in, particularly as communities reopened in June. Revenue for the second quarter grew 26% quarter over quarter and 125% year over year, outperforming the midpoint of our outlook by more than 10%. Active riders increased by more than 3.6 million from Q1 and nearly doubled year over year. Active rider growth in Q2 reflects the fact that people want to get moving again. Airport rides in June were more than double what they were in January and were nearly quadruple what they were a year ago. Given strengthening demand, we made significant investments in driver supply throughout the quarter. The number of drivers increased in Q2 at a faster rate than in Q1 and ended the quarter up more than 60% year over year. While elevated demand drove higher prices, Across the U.S., drivers earn more than ever before. Drivers' average hourly earnings reached an all-time high in Q2. Turning to July, the number of drivers using the Lyft platform grew versus June, and we continued to see nights out and weekend use cases rebounding. We also reintroduced shared rides in select cities with extra precautions to promote rider and driver health safety. We will continue bringing back shared rides as our most affordable option in additional markets as conditions allow, since these rides can help expand our capacity and contribute to an improved balance in our marketplace. John will provide key business updates, but before he does, I'll turn the call over to Brian to review our financial performance. Thanks, Logan, and good afternoon, everyone. Q2 was an exceptional quarter, truly, truly exceptional. We generated 125% year-over-year revenue growth and for the first time, adjust EBITDA profitability. The second quarter provides powerful validation of our business transformation as we achieve adjust EBITDA profitability with rideshare rides still well below the level reached in Q4 of 2019. Now, before I walk through the details, I want to extend my gratitude to our team members for helping make this milestone possible. Lyft has always attracted talented individuals who are passionate about our mission and embrace our values. With the onset of COVID, our team faced a long list of challenges. They responded with inspiring resilience and a tenacious focus on our long-term vision. Together, we built a financially stronger and healthier business that will support our continued growth and expansion. Our business is a reflection of their commitment and hard work. In addition, from day one, we have been driver-centric. We've always known that it is critically important to invest in our driver community and create compelling opportunities for them to use Lyft. It is important to know that in Q2, we achieved our business results while we intentionally reduced our effective take rate. As Logan mentioned, drivers generated record hourly earnings on our platform. In the second quarter, we significantly increased our investments in incentives and sign-on bonuses to help us attract, retain, and grow hours from drivers to meet strengthening demand. In fact, incentives classified as contra revenue increased 92% quarter over quarter to over 375 million, well above the 26% sequential increase in revenue, still with Lyft achieving adjusted EBITDA profitability. Since our inception, skeptics have debated the ride-sharing business model, and the events over the past year encouraged some to question why going deeper as a transportation network makes sense. We have now demonstrated the tremendous value of our transportation focus. Going forward, we expect to remain adjust EBITDA profitable as we increase investments to fuel long-term growth. Before I move on, I want to note that unless otherwise indicated, all income statement measures that follow are non-GAAP and exclude stock-based compensation and other select items. A reconciliation of historical GAAP to non-GAAP results is available on our investor relations website 
and they'd be found in our earnings release, which is furnished with our Form 8K filed today with the SEC. Let's move to the details. As we previously reported, average daily rideshare ride volume decreased slightly in April relative to March. Despite elevated prices, beginning in May, rideshare ride volume rebounded and then further accelerated in June as more states reopened, including California. In Q2, the number of active riders increased by over 3.6 million quarter over quarter to 17.1 million. This represents 27% quarter over quarter growth and nearly 100% year over year growth. As states began to reopen, we benefited from a return of riders from prior quarters, as well as new rider activations, which increased 26% quarter over quarter. Revenue per active rider decreased slightly quarter over quarter and increased by more than $5.50 year over year to $44.63. Rider activations increased 7% month over month in May and increased a further 9% in June. Rider activations near the end of a quarter are typically dilutive to revenue per active rider since there's less time to generate revenue. Helping to offset this headwind was the recognition of licensing revenue from Argo related to data to help accelerate the development of autonomous vehicles. The combination of these trends, especially the addition of over 3.6 million active riders, led to an over $150 million sequential increase in second quarter revenue to $765 million. Q2 revenue is $75 million above the midpoint of our revenue outlook of $680 to $700 million. Similar to the first quarter, elevated rideshare pricing in Q2 drove record rideshare revenue per ride, which had a beneficial impact on profitability metrics since certain costs are relatively fixed like depreciation or less correlated to the price of rides, for example, computing costs. This led to all-time record contribution margin and adjusted EBITDA margin. Contribution margin in the second quarter was 59.1%, which well exceeded our outlook of 56.5% to 57.5%, and was up substantially from the 35% in Q2 of 2020. The outperformance on revenue and contribution margin relative to our outlook helped drive strong Q2 contribution of $452 million, which is nearly four times the level generated in Q2 of 2020. We exceeded the midpoint of our contribution outlook by nearly $60 million, or 15%. For each dollar of incremental revenue growth, contribution increased by over 70 cents. As a reminder, contribution excludes changes to the liabilities for insurance required by regulatory agencies attributable to historical periods. As we previously discussed, to help reduce volatility in our financial results, on April 22nd, we signed an agreement to reinsure our captive insurance entity for select historical periods. In the second quarter, there was no adverse development net of reinsurance recoverables from this policy. Let's move to operating expenses. Operations and support expense for Q2 was 86 million, a decrease of 2% year over year. Operations and support expense as a percentage of revenue declined to 11.3% in Q2, down from 13.7% in Q1. R&D expense in Q2 was $130 million, roughly flat with the level in Q1. As a percentage of revenue, R&D expense declined to a 17% in Q2, down from 21.7% in Q1. Q2 sales and marketing was $89 million. As a percentage of revenue, sales and marketing was 11.6%, roughly flat with Q1's 11.4%. Within sales and marketing, incentives were only $10 million, or 1.4% of revenue. This represents a decline of over 20% quarter over quarter. G&A expense in Q2 was $153 million, down 9% from the year ago period. G&A expense as a percentage of revenue was 20% in Q2, down 550 basis points quarter over quarter. In terms of the bottom line, our Q2 adjusted EBITDA profit of $24 million was over $60 million better than the midpoint of our loss outlook of between 35 and 45 million. It's worth noting that Q2 adjusted EBITDA included $16 million of benefits related to two items. First, we were able to ultimately settle on long outstanding receivables as Hertz exited bankruptcy. 
Separately, we've captured gains from the remarketing of flex drive and lift rental vehicles, given the strong market for used cars. Without these gains totaling $16 million, our Q2 adjusted EBITDA profit was $8 million. Unrestricted cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments slightly increased quarter over quarter to $2.2 billion. We expect unrestricted cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments to increase again in Q3 with the sale of Level 5, which closed in July. Before I move to our Q3 outlook, I want to remind investors that while declining COVID case counts in Q2 fueled a rebound in our business, the pandemic is not yet over, especially with emerging variants and a return of restrictions in certain markets. We are cautiously keeping an eye on new developments and expect continued volatility and variability among cities. Future conditions can change rapidly and may impact our outlook. Now, in terms of average daily rideshare ride trends, despite the recent growth in COVID case counts, July was our best month since March of 2020. Now, to avoid impacting long-term rider loyalty, we are focused on providing our users with the best possible experience. To date, riders have been relatively patient with the less than ideal prices and service levels since they are faced industry-wide. Although we expect supply tailwinds from the expiration of federal unemployment benefits, we plan to maintain elevated levels of new driver sign-up bonuses and incentives even as prices in our marketplace are expected to decline. If growth is stronger than expected, we plan to incrementally increase investments to add more drivers given current service levels and expected demand recovery trends. This strategy will limit potential upside in Q3 revenue and adjust EBITDA. We want to improve rider satisfaction and be ready ahead of additional demand recovery. We believe this is the right decision, even though it will temporarily dampen Q3 revenue growth and adjust EBITDA leverage. It's also important to understand that certain factors in the second quarter were unique and are not expected to recur to the same degree, especially the elevated prices of rides. The pricing environment in the second quarter caused by the demand inflection contributed to a 7% quarter over quarter increase in ride share revenue per ride, which positively impacted our top line operating leverage and profitability. As I mentioned, we are maintaining elevated supply investments to help lower prices in Q3 for our rider community. And as a result, we expect rideshare revenue per ride will decline on a sequential basis. Now, our Q3 financial results will benefit from the sales level five, which closed on July 13th. With a mid-July close, we expect to remove roughly $20 million of related costs in Q3 relative to Q2. We also expect to generate licensing related to the commercial agreements. However, in Q3, the impact of lower prices, along with the elevated driver supply investments, will exceed the quarterly cost savings of the Level 5 sale. In terms of our outlook, barring a material decline in the operating landscape due to COVID, we expect revenue of between $850 and $860 million. This implies growth of between 70 to 72% year-over-year and between 11 to 12% quarter-over-quarter. This outlook embeds an estimated $30 to $40 million impact from lower prices combined with elevated new driver sign-on bonuses and incentives. And to repeat, if demand growth is stronger, we expect to increase our supply investment. In terms of profitability, which is net of the $30 to $40 million headwind I just described, we expect Q3 contribution margin to be between 58.5 to 59% as we generate expense leverage from volume growth that offsets the lower pricing environment and supply investments. When evaluating quarter-over-quarter quarter trends, Q2 contribution margin was 58.1% adjusted for the 100 basis point uplift from the remarketing gains. In terms of the bottom line, we expect that Q3 adjusted EBITDA will be between 25 and 35 million, inclusive of the impact from the supply investments and lower prices. This is relative to the $8 million of adjusted EBITDA in Q2, excluding the $16 million of benefits from Hertz and remarketing. Just to repeat my earlier comment, to the extent we realize incremental leverage beyond our target range, we plan to reinvest in additional supply given industry-wide service levels and expected demand recovery trends. The Q3 outlook implies adjusted EBITDA margin of between 3 and 4%. This compares with 1% in Q2, excluding the $16 million of benefits. Separately, based on our momentum, 
and the anticipated second half recovery, we now expect that Lyft will achieve adjusted EBITDA profitability on a full year basis in 2021, which is another important milestone. So in closing, I want to emphasize two key points. First, we've built a much stronger business. Our exceptional second quarter provides clear visibility into the extent of the improvements we've made. And these changes are designed to be lasting. We continue to expect to emerge on the other side of the pandemic structurally more profitable and more efficient per ride than we were going in. Second, we are a growth company. Achieving profitability is an important milestone to demonstrate the strength of our model, and we plan to maintain adjusted EBITDA profitability going forward. At the same time, we believe it is in the best interest of shareholders for Lyft to avoid over-rotating on profitability too early. Beyond the recovery, we have a large untapped market opportunity in front of us. We have a TAM in excess of $1 trillion, which provides a long growth runway. We plan to reinvest a portion of our adjusted EBITDA profitability in new growth initiatives, which we look forward to discussing in the coming quarters. These strategic investments expand on our core competencies and monetize assets that are part of or underpin the Lyft ecosystem. As Logan shared, we expect to build a significantly larger company as we attack the massive market opportunity in front of us as a transportation-focused pure play. Going forward, we will thoughtfully balance investments in growth and profitability considerations while deliberately leaning more towards growth, especially in these early days. Our financial North Star is to maximize long-term free cash flow growth per share. We believe this is the metric most aligned with how to generate long-term shareholder value. So with that, let me turn it over to John to provide key updates on the business and our strategy. Thanks, Brian. I'm energized by our Q2 performance and excited for the quarters ahead of us. Again, I want to thank the Lyft community for making this possible. We look forward to maintaining profitability as we self-fund initiatives that will drive long-term shareholder value. Let me start with near-term dynamics. I'm going to talk about overall marketplace conditions and the progress we've made. Demand in Q2 came back faster and stronger than initially anticipated. That's fundamentally a good thing. Industry-wide, we've seen demand outpace supply, and service levels and prices have been less than ideal for riders. We know people depend on us for excellent service, and we are working hard to improve the experience. Great hospitality is core to our brand. Our efforts to improve wait times for riders are critical to delivering on this and to grow usage by drivers and riders. To that end, we ramped our investments in driver supply in Q2 and welcomed 50% more new drivers versus Q1. In fact, we achieved a post-COVID quarterly record for new driver activations. Drivers also earned more. In some of our busiest markets, drivers have been earning more than $35 an hour on average over all online time. This includes time drivers may have been earning on other app-based platforms. We saw continued driver growth in July, and earnings have remained elevated versus pre-COVID. It's clear that ride-sharing remains a highly compelling earnings opportunity, one with exceptional flexibility, which we believe will serve as an ongoing tailwind to meet more demand. In addition, to keep the most active drivers engaged, we are working to build out our rewards program to include benefits that can help them reduce their maintenance costs and receive priority access to ride requests. We'll also continue to experiment with new incentive structures to make it even more rewarding for drivers to use the Lyft platform. Ultimately, while exact comparisons are difficult, the higher earnings opportunities that may be available with rideshare versus other forms of app-based work can help Lyft supply as the recovery progresses. We expect the roll-off of enhanced federal unemployment benefits will also serve as a tailwind, especially since the majority of drivers use Lyft to generate supplemental income. In Q2, we saw an uplift in driver applicant growth in states that opted out of the federal program early, ahead of their participation ending. Likewise, as vaccines continue to roll out, we are hopeful that life can resume a more normal cadence. Kids going back to school can give households more flexibility, and people may have more reasons to seek out incremental earnings opportunities to save for vacations, weddings, and other personal activities. We've also been investing in our technology to make the driver experience better and better. 
In July, we launched a major app redesign that was the product of nearly a year of engineering work. Just as one example, we've now made it much more intuitive for drivers to easily identify earning opportunities while offline or idle. The rollout of our new interface had an immediate impact on our marketplace, resulting in an increase in both driver hours and rides. The bottom line is we've managed similar marketplace dynamics for a decade and are very confident in the strategic actions we're taking for both the short and long term. Let me switch gears and talk about the Lyft network more broadly. Rideshare is critical, but the power of the network is more than that. The Lyft network is the culmination of all the transportation demand, the options we make available across rideshare, bikes, scooters, rentals, and transit, as well as our marketplace and platform technology that has been built and optimized over the last decade. This robust technology platform is what powers every ride match and every dispatch, among many other things. We will continue to invest in building the best technology as these investments can generate significant returns today and far into the future. For example, over the last few years, we've been investing in building our own in-house mapping technology, specifically for our transportation network. By building maps for Lyft, by Lyft, we are working to be able to recommend better routes to drivers, ones that can promote safety, reduce our insurance risk, improve the reliability of the pickup and drop-off experience, and better optimize our overall marketplace. Enhancements like these can bring multiple cents of additional margin to each ride, adding up to millions of dollars each year. We are testing our own navigation experience in select markets today and have over a million and a half miles under our belt already. As we progress through this year, we'll continue iterating and working to launch the best dedicated navigation experience possible. Our goal is to pass the savings we achieve from initiatives like these on to riders. The more value riders receive from Lyft, the more likely they are to use Lyft more often, and the more likely we are to attract new riders. Ultimately, to unlock more of our TAM, riders should be able to spend less on transportation overall but more on the Lyft network. And by establishing ourselves as their trusted transportation network, we believe riders will increasingly turn to Lyft to help them transition to transportation as a service. We also deliver significant value to users with our exclusive content, meaning with the bikes, scooters, car rentals, and vehicle services that are only available through Lyft. Our vehicle service center's high customer satisfaction scores reflect the work we've done to reimagine the auto care experience. In addition, we've found that when less frequent rideshare riders start using our bikes and scooters, they quickly start using both more often. Differentiated content can help us increase our touch points with riders and grow our share of the consumer transportation wallet. Longer term, each of the strategic investments we are making in the Lyft network put us in the best position to win the autonomous transition. Both the mapping investments and fleet management work are perfect examples of our focused transportation strategy that has high value in both the short and long term. In the near term, riders and drivers benefit with better and more affordable service. And in the long term, Lyft can be the go-to transportation network for autonomous vehicles because of our holistic transportation services that drive preferred economics. In fact, our recently announced partnership with Argo and Ford reinforces this unique role the Lyft network can play to help advance the performance and safety of autonomous vehicles and their ultimate commercialization. We look forward to building on these partnerships and to welcoming new partners to our network. Finally, before we move to Q&A, I'd like to take a moment on the Massachusetts Ballot Initiative. This week, the coalition of workers and companies that we're a part of is moving forward with petitions for a ballot initiative for the November 2022 election. While our priority is to find a legislative solution in Massachusetts, this is part of our continued efforts to advocate what the vast majority of drivers want, the flexible earning opportunities our platform provides, plus new benefits. While we are pursuing the ballot option, we are also closely engaged with the Massachusetts State Legislature and are continuing to work with them on a potential legislative solution. We're now ready to take questions. And to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your touchtone phone. 
And our first question is from Dog and Moth of J.P. Morgan. Please ask your question. Great. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, just a couple on driver supply and incentives. Um, I was hoping you could just help us understand where you are with driver supply just relative to current demand, maybe if there's a percentage way of looking at it uh, relative to like 100% for a fully balanced marketplace. And then um, second, can you just talk about how much you're roughly targeting in terms of incentives for 3Q uh, coming off of the $375 million in, in 2Q? Thank you. Sure, Doug, this is Brian. Uh, uh, let me take that in reverse order. Let me talk about Q3, and then I'll just talk about, you know, overall driver supply. Um, so in the third quarter, uh, we plan to increase supply investments, just given current conditions, and to just help prepare our marketplace for uh, additional demand recovery. So we do expect Q3 country revenue to exceed $376 million. Now, given this, this strategy and, you know, the expected impact from the Q2 investments, as, as John pointed out, uh, new driver growth in Q2 jumped 50% quarter over quarter. Um, we expect prices to decline in Q3 as we improve these service, uh, or sorry, supply conditions. So the financial impact of maintaining elevated new driver bonuses and incentives while prices decline is estimated at 30 to 40 million. So you really have to sort of look at those combined. And just to call out again, that this is built into our outlook of 850 to 860 million. And to the extent we realize incremental growth or leverage in the third quarter, we, we plan to further reinvest in supply and grow driver activation. It's just the right thing to do right now to prepare for additional demand. And again, you know, this is after we achieved adjusted the job profitability and, and expect to maintain it. Um, in terms of just the, the recovery overall, the driver front, it, it's important to, to understand that you just can't measure in terms of the number of drivers. Um, you have to, you know, measure in terms of, you know, looking at the number of hours or the number of rides per driver as well. And we have seen the number of rides per driver increase uh, versus pre-COVID periods. And so, you know, as a data point, in the second quarter of this year, the average number of rides per driver was more than 20% greater than Q2 of 2019. And the number of drivers is also increasing as we onboard new drivers. Uh, so again, we increased driver activations by more than 50% quarter on quarter in Q2. And looking forward, we're going to continue to invest in building supply uh, to improve service levels. And, and these efforts are already paying off. Just an additional data point, in July, we increased new driver activations 11% month on month. Great. That's helpful. Thank you, Brian. Sure. Our next question is from Eagle Aronian of Wedbush Securities. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question. I um, I want to ask on uh, rider incentives, and um, you know, as you you know, right now you're you're, you're cutting back on rider incentives. Obviously, there's there's significant demand. What's your outlook over the coming kind of months and quarters for how that for how that normalizes? And then second, um, any update on business travel, um, specifically maybe given the the, cult, the the Delta variant and and that spiking, are you seeing any kind of you know backwards moving momentum? Anything you're seeing early on or expectations there too? Thanks. Sure. Oh, go ahead, Brett. Well, let me let me comment on the on the um, sales and marketing uh, and start there. So I mean just. You know, um, if you look uh, at uh, Q2, um, this is our fifth quarter in a row where we kept sales and marketing below uh, 15%, right? And when you look at the incentives in sales and marketing as percentage of revenue, you know, in Q4, we were at 3.5%. In Q1, we were at 2.2%, and we just now had a quarter at 1.4%. So again, we feel really good about um, you know where we are in terms of um, on the demand side. Uh, as pointed out, uh, active riders jumped over 3.6 million in Q2. And if you look at rider activation, so these are new riders for the first time on Lyft, those jumped 112 percent year over year in Q2. So we feel great about that. But I think just to repeat what we're trying to stress in terms of our long-term strategy. We want to win on product innovation, the stuff that, that John was describing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's innovation, it's the customer experience, it's the brand preference, it's not coupons. So uh, we believe that the R&D investments are the right lever here to create the competitive advantages. And so we expect, you know, absolute sales and marketing will increase 
in future periods is obviously as revenue rebounds, but longer term, sales and marketing expenses and percentage of revenue will likely be lower post COVID than it was pre COVID. Thanks. And then, uh, yeah, in terms of on the, on the business side, um, you know, I would say, you know, the one area that really stood out, one use case that stood out in Q2 was airport rides. And I think historically, airport rides, there's obviously, you know, consumer personal travel that's baked to that as well as corporate travel. Uh, you know, in terms of just the overall impact to the results, uh, we did see strengthening in airport rides. And so in June, airport rides as a percent of total rideshare rides reached 8.3% which is up 5X from the 1.6% at the bottom in April 2020. And quite frankly, it's approaching the 9.5% we had in December of 2019. Uh, and so I think that is a combination. I think in terms of, you know, um, post, you know, in this recovery, um, you know, we expect all use cases to return. We expect that commute rides to, to strengthen as more companies return to the office. And we expect business travel should begin to, you know, increase and accelerate around the same time this year and then really accelerate next year. Uh, thank you. Your next question is from Stephen Zhu of Credit Suisse. So please ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I guess I have kind of an interconnected question on the incentives. So I guess maybe for John or Logan. So, you know, presumably as you increase the payouts of driver incentives in the third quarter, you know, your competitor will probably respond in a similar way. So, you know, it looks like you're going to reach over a billion dollars of incentive spend this year, which is about 2x what you had been spending in 2019. So you know, between the two of you and the steps that you're about to take, is this just a matter of making ride share more attractive and, a, I guess, an irresistible thing for drivers to be doing to earn money versus other things that they can be doing? And I guess on the rider side of things, I guess one of the things that we worry about as the ASPs remain at an elevated level is perhaps the danger of some of your riders switching off and using some something else if the prices are too high and especially if they have the options. So it seems like riders are coming back regardless given the sequential growth here, but is there anything you're seeing in, in terms of activity among existing users, you know, maybe signs of them switching off or turning off? Thanks. Thanks for the question, this is Logan. So for, first on the driver side, we've always viewed the, you know, the, the market for drivers is large and broad, and we've always looked at it, you know, taking the broad view, looking at the whole labor pool. And obviously, you know, COVID has, you know, sent chocks through the, the whole labor market uh, that significantly impacted us and, you know, most of the other players out there, as well as a, a host of other businesses. And so as, as we look at, you know, uh, sort of driver incentives, they really, you know, blend for us as we're running the business, um, you know, a along with just what is driver pay, right? What, what's the price of labor at that time of day in that city? Um, it is, you know, it is unique. It is dynamic. Um, and, and it's our job to stay on top of it and, and to move with the market. And, and so we're always looking to, uh, you know, ensure we're paying drivers competitively uh, and provide the best service levels. And, you know, as, as we pay, as, you know, driver pay increases, more drivers come onto the platform. And it's not just pulling from, you know, uh, for, from our, our closest competitor. It's, you know, it's pulling from the market more broadly. Um, so that's, that's kind of our, our long view. Um, we really don't, don't kind of look at it in a, in a narrow sense. Um, Brian, I'm wondering if more more color would be helpful. Yeah, I think John's going to say something, and then let me chime in. Yeah, well, one of the points I just want to make is, and, and you see in some of the, the numbers Brian recently talked about, uh, is that one thing we've really invested deeply in over the last, I'd say, two years has been the marketplace technology that underpins almost everything we do. So, like, as an example, these are not actual numbers, but if you have – uh, 100 drivers in the region, and, you know, prior to improving your routing and mapping technology, which we talked a bit about, uh, you could uh, complete 150 rides uh, with in, in a one-hour period with those 100 drivers. Uh, there are cases where you can complete more now, 
say, 175, 200 rides uh, with that same pool of drivers. Now, that's good for drivers. Drivers earn more, uh, and they have less downtime, and it's good for the business, and it's good for riders. So a lot of the investments that we've been making over the last two years will, will really show uh, in an earnings report like this, uh, and we hope in the earnings reports uh, to come, but, but often are hopefully invisible to the customer because uh, it's more under the hood. And Stephen, let me just maybe just add, and I'll, I'll pivot to your, your, your second part of your question. Now, I would say in general, both companies seem focused on onboarding new drivers uh, and welcoming back drivers who may have stopped driving during the pandemic. And so according to third-party data, the, you know, the industry does continue to appear generally rational in the design and structure of supply investments. So we don't see a strategic change here in terms of the competition. And from our vantage, we just achieved adjusting the down profitability and plan to, to maintain it. And I think beyond Q3, we, we believe as federal unemployment benefits expire, we will benefit from organic supply tailwinds. We also expect that we may see an influx of delivery drivers if delivery slows once communities fully reopen. And you just, you know, remember in the gig economy, rideshare tends to be king. You know, while exact comparisons are difficult, we believe the earning opportunities are greater in rideshare based on historical uh, studies, which again does provide some organic tailwind. I think in terms of your second part of your question, in terms of, you know, uh, alternatives for riders, you know, look, right now the, the industry is supply constrained given there's just so much demand. Um, but to date, you know, riders have been relatively patient with the less than ideal prices and service levels since they're faced industry wide. And though, you know, we, we do again expect some of these uh, tailwinds, we want to improve rider satisfaction, be ready ahead of additional um, demand. And, I would just say, again, keep in mind, in Q2, we added over 3.6 million active riders, uh, which, again, was up nearly 100% year-over-year, up 27% quarter-over-quarter, and new rider activations. Again, these are people brand new to Lyft as riders, increased 112% year-over-year. So, again, um, you know, we expect our marketplace to fully rebalance, and eventually we will exceed our uh, prior active rider peak. Thank you. Our next question is from Mark Mahaney of ISI. Your line is open. Hey, Mark. Mr. Mahaney, your line is now open. Please ask your question. I apologize. I was muted. Um, could you talk about new use cases that you may have seen for Lyft for ride sharing uh, over the pandemic, if you've noticed uh, new patterns, new use cases? And, and I guess throwing into that, you know, with um, still uh, safety concerns over potentially over um, taxis and, and, and public transportation, whether that's created kind of at the margin incremental demand. Can you see that in the data? And then secondly, uh, you know, the profitability goal that you uh, reached clearly on you know, much lower um, uh, levels than you had, uh, you know, prior to the, prior to the, prior to COVID. So does that, what does that say about your long-term profitability margins? And I can't remember. I think at the time of the, your IPO, you laid out some long-term margins, and that's a world away. So what are you thinking now in terms of long-term, at scale, what, what, what kind of margins the business can generate, given what you've now been able to accomplish, you know, in obviously a very uh, different environment than we all thought would be the case, you know, a year or two ago? Hey, thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll start. This is Logan. Uh, in, in, in terms of use cases, uh, you know, one of the most, I think, exciting innovations was something we scaled up at the beginning of the pandemic was a product we're calling Wait and Save. And as we sunset shared rides at the start of the pandemic, uh, we wanted to, uh, you know, give our riders another great option for trading off time and money. And that's what Wait and Save unlocks. It, it captures some of the efficiency of having uh, riders wait a little longer until we have a, a nearby driver that we can match them with. Um, and we still hit that, you know, within a, a sort of specified or arrival window. Um, you know, so we, we just started a couple weeks ago uh, reintroducing shared rides. So we're, we're going to have both of those uh, side by side and sort of learn, learn what uh, folks prefer and how those work together. Um, in terms of kind of use case changes, there's definitely a good chunk of our riders who moved over from public transit as the pandemic sort of hit. Um, so we saw, you know, a, a new type of rider, um, you know, join the network and, and sort of ride frequency in, increase uh, there. And, you know, it's, um, 
it's tough to know exactly how much will stick. We imagine a good chunk sticks, um, and and some I'm sure will go back to transit. Um, transit, you know, ridership has picked up a little bit, but it's still kind of depressed overall. Um, you know, I, another another front is just on the bikes and scooter business. We've seen volume almost double year over year. So clearly, there's you know a real preference for uh, you know outdoor transportation. Uh, so so seeing seeing some interesting things there. And you know as we kind of take a, a a broader view on you know where where we're going with the company and transportation, um, you know I think a you know there there's a lot of exciting things for us to do on the fleet side of the business and in terms of helping people manage their personal vehicles. And we know a, a good chunk of, you know, Lyft riders and regular Lyft, Lyft users um, still have a, a car or two parked in their driveway. And so we're, we're looking at more and more ways that we can help them. So b- broadly speaking, um, you know, we don't know the timing, but we expect the rideshare business to, you know, make a, a full uh, healthy recovery. Um, and we expect the, you know, the market to continue growing more broadly. Um, Brian, did you want to weigh in on some of the long-term sure. economic? Sure. So, far, obviously, the, the pandemic isn't over. And so, given continued uncertainty, we're only providing a, a one-quarter outlook at this time. And in terms of just where we are, look, we, we went public now a little over two years ago, so it's still relatively early. But I am incredibly pleased, though, at our progress to date. And again, our, our Q2 results speak volumes on our progress. Um, but we're not going to speculate today on the time frame or what ultimate margins could reach. Okay, understood. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Logan. Your next question is from Ed Aruma of Key Bank Capital. Please ask your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. I guess first, um, what's governing the rollout of shared rides, and what has the consumer response been thus far? And then as a follow-up question, any update on Pink? And I know I think the J.P. Morgan agreement sunsetted what was the retention of those uh, customers into Pink that you onboard to see that product? Thank you. Sure. On on, sh- on shared rides, we're we're, we're learning. Um, you know, so we, so we've done a, a lot of great work on the product. To uh, you know, we, we took took a lot of the year while it was sunset to rebuild a number of underlying systems and experiences, so that we can provide riders with better reliability both experience in terms of how quickly they're going to get picked up, in terms of how quickly they're going to get to the destination and sort of maximum number of stops or reroutes along the way. Um, and, and and we think, you know, sort of top to bottom, it's, it's a better product, but we haven't tested that in the real world. And uh, and so we're, we're bringing that back to see how, how it performs and to see what, what rider reception is like. Um, you know, obviously, it's the it's the one product where you're in the car with um, multiple other other riders. So we wanted to see what the what the reception looks like, and as we learn, you know, we'll we'll adjust um, and sort of dictate the rollout from there. Right now, it's you know, it's just in a uh, sort of very small uh, small area for us to to learn at low volume. Um, can you re- repeat the second part of your question? I believe it was on Lyft Pink. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe an update on Pink generally, and I believe that the agreement you had with J.P. Morgan where their customers got a one-year pre, I think, sunsetted. Any sense as to kind of how many of those customers that maybe got the pre year stayed on the program? Sure. I can take the uh, Chase piece, uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase piece. Uh, this is John, and then pass it back to Logan for higher-level thoughts on Pink. Um, overall, with Chase, we've been pleased with the, the program and the partnership. Uh, really gives millions of card members even more reasons to use Lyft. Uh, We actually extended the partnership benefit this year to include a 5X points promotion on all Lyft rides for Chase's co-branded credit card members. Uh, And and we think this will continue to be attractive, obviously, as we come through the recovery and travel continues to rebound. uh, We're we're excited about continuing to to work with this partner. They've They've been great across the board, even uh, supported us on our universal vaccine access program. Great. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, the program has, has not sunset. So it was it was always designed as a, a free year for all new, uh, for all Sapphire members. Um, that That's still out there in the market. And in fact, it was extended for an additional six months uh, for all those folks who participated. 
Um, so that is still active and live. Um, we're not <clears throat> not disclosing any kind of unique metrics around Pink. Um, it, it, it's a program we're still very excited about, um, and you know, continually investing in add, adding new benefits. Uh, so you know, now we have uh, free upgrades when you book a, a rental car, a Lyft. Um, use Lyft rentals to book a sixth rental. You will get a free upgrade if you're a Pink member. Um, we, you know, of course, are leaning into our great partnership we have with Grubhub, where Pink members get unlimited free delivery as part of the Grubhub Plus uh, program. Uh, so we're going to, you know, keep, keep leaning into making Lyft Pink uh, more and more valuable for our riders. Um, you know, but but as far as kind of uh, you know, marketing pink at this moment, we've, you know, been been holding back as we focus on the supply side of our market, right? So so pink will play a big role, you know, in the future of the company. Um, but right now it's all about supply. And, and so we are leaning in on, on all dimensions to bring new drivers onto the road and to, uh, you know, engage existing drivers um, and make sure we have a, a great driver waiting for every rider. Great. Thanks so much. Our next question is from Brent Phil of Jefferies. Please ask your question. And in, in past releases, you put a, a, a monthly update for the you know last trailing month. And in this release, I don't think you had that. Any color on July, and any kind of reason why you left it up this time? No, it, 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 maybe we. I probably spoke too quickly. Uh, so if you look at average daily rideshare rides. July was our best month uh, since March of 2020. We saw growth month over month, and it was an all-time high. Okay, terrific. Sure. Our next question is from Michael. Does Nanny of Bernstein, your line is open. Please ask your question. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. A couple, if I may. Um, on the driver's side, with the drivers that are reactivating, uh, what kind of retention and engagement rates are you seeing? Uh, are reactivated drivers, you know, sticking around, uh, or are they, you know, reactivating for for maybe shorter durations to capture um, some of these incentives? Uh, incentives. And then, uh, second question again on the driver front is: um, you mentioned that in certain states where the federal funding program, programs have started to roll off, uh, seeing better driver applications. Just any way to quantify what that benefit looks like um, versus other states? Thank you. Thanks, Nikhil. This is, this is Brian. I think on um, – uh, well, let me, let me just start with part two, and I'll, I'll come back to, to, to part one. So on, on part two, uh, we saw this last summer, too. So we have a couple data points here. When, when federal unemployment benefits initially expired last summer, we did see uh, leads jump. Um, you know, because, again, you have to remember, you know, most drivers, it's, it's supplemental income. Um, you know, it's – in 2020, 85% of drivers drove less than 10 hours per week. So again, when you have federal unemployment benefits, it may solve that that need that you are you know using less to generate income. It may you may just have enough from the benefits. And so we saw it last summer. We we saw it in the states that uh, sunset the the benefits early that leads jumped. Um, and so again, I think we're. So we'll, we'll see, I think it's September 8th, that the, the federal uh, full program will sunset. But in general, it does increase leads from folks who uh, were earning enough on the platform, um, or sorry, where the benefits from the, the government and maybe some state benefits on top were, were, were covering whatever supplemental income needs they needed and why they were driving a uh, lift in the first place. Um, and then in terms of the, um, on the drivers that are activating, I will say, I mean, directionally, uh, retention has been phenomenal because uh, you have to remember this, this environment. You know, we, we're excited that drivers are earning all-time record hourly earnings right now. So it's, it's very lucrative to drive. Um, and so you can imagine if you onboard in this environment, um, you know, it, it, it's a great platform and it's a great time. So retention has been very strong. And, and as John mentioned, we're seeing that strong activation growth, too. Again, 50% growth quarter over quarter in Q2. And as I mentioned, in just in the month of July, we saw 11% growth month over month in, in new driver activations. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Brian Fitzgerald of Wells Fargo. Please ask your question. 
Thanks. Uh, maybe two quick follows, one on drivers. Um, and it's just, as you're onboarding these guys, is it, is it faster, easier to onboard existing drivers versus new ones, or is it just rote volumes is overweighing that? And then I want to go back to a, a comment you guys talked about, and, and that was, hey, the, the marketplace technology, optimizing routes and mapping and, and driving yields there. Uh, uh, how much of that is also predicated on ample supply of certain ilks or experience levels of drivers um, so that you can properly do that route. So this experienced guy doesn't have to take a left in front of traffic. And, and are those two, do those two flywheels impact each other? And, and do you get, you know, as you get more drivers on, can, does that just amp up the, the momentum you get out of your, your marketplace tech optimization flywheel? I'll start with the second part of the question, maybe, Brian, if you take the, the first. I'd, I'd say that the, the, the flywheel is improved by volume broadly. So the, the more volume we have on the platform, the more opportunities we have to learn. And, you know, we, we learn what the, the safest routes are. Um, you know, we learn what the characteristics of the, the safest and most productive drivers, you know, look like more broadly. So volume, volume is, um, you know, is important for driving learnings. We obviously have all of our historical data that we can learn from, so we're not sort of, um, you know, the the kind of real-time data uh, layers on and is another factor. Um, but but we're not extremely sensitive to the kind of volume of real-time data we have. If that kind of gets gets at the at the crux of your question, um, Brian, if you want to talk to kind of the you know, reactivation versus new, new driver activation? Sure. Aspect. Absolutely. So I think right now it, it, it's not an either or, it's an and, right? So we are bringing on new, new, or sorry, new drivers. And as I mentioned, it's just, it is an amazing time to activate on the platform uh, because almost any hour of the day, you can turn on the, the driver app, which we redesigned, and, and you can start earning uh, almost immediately, uh, which has been fantastic. So as I mentioned, Retention of new drivers is looking really strong. Um, in terms of what we maybe you know, I'll call it deep resurrection, these are drivers who drove a ton on our platform, and then maybe with the onset of COVID, they just didn't feel safe. You know, I think as we um, you know get the nation vaccinated, um, we'll have to get through you know Delta, which you know will, will potentially impact certain regions, et cetera. Um, you know we are going to see some of those folks come back, as I mentioned. You know, sort of in the, the, the ecosystem of the, the gig economy, rideshare tends to, you know, based on historical studies, uh, has tended to uh, allow folks to earn more. And so uh, we do expect that you'll see folks uh, who like the, the independence um, from the gig work to come back to rideshare. So we're, we're, it's really an it's a, it's a, it's a and, not an or. Yep. Got it. Thanks, guys. Sure. And our last question is from Itay Michaeli of the city. Please ask your question. Uh, great. Thanks, everybody. Just two quick ones for me. First, just on the financials, um, on the operations and support expense, it looks like you, you were at 11% this quarter. I think pre-pandemic you were in 13 uh, to 14% range. You know, kind of curious how much leverage you think you'll see there uh, going forward as revenue recovers. And then secondly, just hoping to touch on, on the Argo uh, announcement recently. Maybe talk to any uh, – should we think about that, that agreement being any different than what you're doing uh, with Motional, or are they fairly kind of similar deployments? Sure. So let me take part one, and then maybe I'll hand off uh, to John. So I think for – uh, operations and support expense, this is there. We probably expect it to tick up slightly uh, in Q3. Within operations and support, we do have uh, background checks um, and driving record checks. As that expense hits that, so as we drive up driver activations, you'll see an increase there. And then it's sometimes correlated to just the, the ride growth on bikes and scooters. Um, and so we, we do expect we'll probably go up a little bit, I would say, um, you know, probably, I think we're 11.3% in Q2. I think, you know, probably around 12% or under. So it will likely go up a little bit. But again, I think it's primarily tied to the fact that we're activating more drivers and, and filling up our funnel, which I think is very good in terms of uh, setting up the marketplace for Q4 and beyond. On the Argo deal, uh, it's the third deal in a string of commercial agreements between Lyft and major automakers and their affiliates uh, focused on self-driving technology. 
Uh, so as you mentioned, Motional, uh, we're working to deploy fully autonomous cars on our network starting in 2023. Argo plus Ford, as the first time with all three pieces, the cars, the AV software, and the network, I think what we're really demonstrating is that the path to commercializing self-driving vehicles at scale is through the Lyft network. And it goes back to the point we've made about the marketplace technology. Uh, we can help drivers be more successful, uh, Lyft be more successful, riders have more affordable rides, and AV suppliers uh, get a better return on their cars because of all these investments we've made under the hood uh, that are leading to, to this great quarter. Um, the, the other the part of the Argo 4 deal is that we uh, had an anonymized service and fleet data partnership uh, to help them also uh, make sure they pick the right markets uh, and the right technology to bring to the right routes. That's all very helpful. Thank you. All right. With that, thank you, everybody, for joining, uh, for being here for this exciting milestone. And we look forward to talking with everybody next quarter. All right. Have a great one.